morning still, a few minutes. The Senate will come to order. The Secretary will call the roll. Senator Brooks? Here. Senator Buck? Here. Senator Canazaro? Here. Senator Dennis? Here. Senator Donate? Here. Senator Dondero Loop? Here. Senator Gokachia? Here. Senator Hammond? Here. Senator Hansen? Here. Senator Hardy? Here. Senator Harris? Here. Senator Kikeffer? Here. Senator Lang? Here. Senator Neal? Here. Senator Orenshaw? Here. Senator Pickard? Here. Senator Ratty? Senator Scheibel, Here. Senator Severs Gansert, Here. Senator Settlemeyer, Here. Senator Spearman. Here. Thank you. Let the record reflect there are 21 senators present. Please rise with a prayer and invocation by Outreach Pastor Don Bauman of the Hilltop Community Church in Carson City. Good and gracious God, uh, our hearts are heavy this morning as we remember the ultimate sacrifice by Officer Eric Talley and the nine people in the Boulder, Colorado grocery store who lost their lives in another act of senseless violence yesterday. We ask for your comfort for Officer Talley's wife and seven children, along with the other nine families whose lives have now been changed forever. We ask for your protection for all in law enforcement who accept the risk of their own safety daily as they put on their uniforms, from those who are protecting this assembly to those who serve where we live. Finally, we ask for the wisdom of Solomon, for this body who've been appointed by you to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right through the laws they enact. May they thread the impossible needle that balances gun ownership while punishing and trying to prevent crimes of gun violence like yesterday. And we ask this in the name of the God of justice, the Lord. Thank you. Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. you. may be seated. Order business number three, reading and approval of the journal. By previous order of the Senate, the reading of the journal is dispensed with, and the President and Secretary are authorized to make the necessary corrections and additions. Order business number six, messages from the Assembly. Assembly Chamber, Carson City, March 22nd, 2021, to the Honorable the Senate. I have the honor to inform your Honorable Body of the Assembly in this day passed Assembly Bill 103, signed Carol Ayala Sala, Assistant Chief Clerk of the Assembly, end of messages. Thank you. Order of business number eight, waivers and exemptions. Notice of exemptions, March 23rd, 2021. The Fiscal Analysis Division, pursuant to Joint Standing Rule 14.6, has determined the eligibility has determined the exemption of Senate Bills numbers 306 and 331 and the eligibility for exemption of Senate Bill 117. Signed Wayne Thorley, Fiscal Analysis Division, end of exemptions. Thank you. Order of business number nine, motions, resolutions, and notices. Um, Senator Canizaro. Thank you, Madam President. I move to take Senate Joint Resolution Number 8 from the 80th session from its place on the Secretary's desk and place it on the resolution file to be considered after Order of Business 13. Thank you. You have heard the motion. All those in favor signify by saying yay. yay. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Senator Canizaro. Senator Ratty. Thank you, President. I'd like to make a motion to suspend Rule 50 and re-refer SB 336 to the Committee on Natural Resources. Thank you. You've heard the motion. Are there any remarks? Senator Ratty. Thank you, President. I appreciate the indulgence of the body. As you all know, we're coming up upon some deadline dates, and this uh, bill had some um, content that would be of interest to both the Commerce and Labor Committee and the Natural Resources Committee, and it allows us to balance some workload to make sure that this bill gets the proper hearing. Thank you. Any further remarks? All right. All those in favor signify by saying yay. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. And that concludes Order of Business 9. Thank you. Order of Business 10, introduction, first reading, and reference. Senate Bill Number 339, introduced by Senator Pickard, etc., Authorize the Unit Owners Association of a Common Interest Community to lease abandoned residential property within the Common Interest Community in certain circumstances. End of bill. Thank you. Senator Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that we refer SB 339 to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank 
excused. Senator Pickard is referred SB 339 to the Committee on Judiciary. Are there any objections to the referral? If not, so order. Senate Bill Number 340, introduced by Senator Neal, revises provisions relating to the wages of working and working conditions of certain employees and of bill. Thank you, Senator Neal. I believe that, it, Madam President, SB 340 goes to Commerce and Labor. Thank you, Senator Neal. As referred to Senate Bill 340, the Committee on Commerce and Labor, are there any objections to the referral? If not, so ordered. Senate Bill 341, introduced by Senator Spearman, revises provisions relating to health care, end of bill. Thank you, Senator Spearman. Thank you, President. I move to refer Senate Bill 341 to your Committee on Health and Human Services. Thank you. Senator Spearman has referred Senate Bill 341 to the Committee on Health and Human Services. Are there any objections to the referral? If not, so ordered. Senate Bill 342, introduced by Senate Committee on Education, revises provisions relating to higher education. End of bill. Thank you. Senator Dennis. Thank you, Madam President. I move to refer Senate Bill 342 to the Committee on Education. Thank you. Senator Dennis has re referred Senate Bill 342 to the Committee on Education. Are there any objections to the referral? If not, so ordered. Senate Bill Number 343, introduced by Senators Pickard, etc., revises provisions relating to education. End of bill. Thank you, Senator Pickard. Thank you, Madam President. I move that uh, we refer Senate Bill 343 to the Committee on Finance. Thank you. Senator Pickard has referred Senate Bill 343 to the Committee on Finance. Are there any objections to the referral? If not, so ordered. Senate Bill Number 344, introduced by Senator Orenshaw, enacts provisions relating to importation, possession, sale, transfer, and breeding of dangerous wild animals. End of bill. Thank you, Senator Orenshaw. Thank you, President. I move that Senate Bill 344 be referred to the Committee on Natural Resources. Thank you. Senator Orenshaw has referred Senate Bill 344 to the Committee on Natural Resources. Are there any objections to the referral? If not, so ordered. Senate Bill number 345, introduced by Senator Orenshaw, revises provisions relating to juvenile justice and a bill. Thank you, Senator Orenshaw. Thank you, President. I move that Senate Bill 345 be referred to, your, to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you. Senator Orenshaw has referred Senate Bill 345 to the Committee on Judiciary. Are there any objections to the referral? If not, so ordered. A Senate Bill number 103, introduced by Assemblyman Martinez and Considine, revises provisions governing the preservation of certain prehistoric sites and of bill. Thank you, Senator Ratty. Thank you, President. I move to refer AB 103 to the Committee on Government Affairs. Thank you, Senator Ratty has referred Senate Bill, uh, I'm, excuse me. Senator Ratty has referred AB 103 to the Committee on Government Affairs. Are there any objections to the referral? If not, so ordered. And that concludes order of business number 10. Thank you. Madam, order of business number Madam 12. Madam President, may we get a one minute recess? Let's take a one minute recess.
Okay, we're back from recess. Let's go back for a minute to order business nine. Um, Senator Ratty. Thank you, President. I'd like to make a motion to rescind the referral of Senate Bill 340. Thank you. You have heard the motion. All those in favor signify by saying yay. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Senator Ratty. Thank you, President. I would like to make a motion to suspend Rule 40 and refer Senate Bill 340 to the Committee on Health and Human Services. Thank you. You've heard the motion. All those in favor signify by saying yay. yay. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. All right, so let's go to um, order. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Secretary. Okay, yeah, let's go to order business 12, uh, second reading. Senate Bill number 42, introduced by Senate Committee on Judiciary. Revises provisions relating to certain court rules and decisions. The people of the state of Nevada represented in the Senate and Assembly do act as follows, section one to section one. Thank you, are there any amendments to the bill? There are none. Thank you, Senate Bill 42, order the general file. Senate Bill number 47, introduced by Senate Committee on Government Affairs, revises provisions governing public borrowing. The people of the state of Nevada represented in the Senate and Assembly do act as follows, section one to section one. Thank you, are there any amendments to the bill? There are none. Thank you, Senate Bill 47, in order to the general file. Senate Bill number 65, introduced by Senate Committee on Natural Resources, revises provisions relating to the State Department of Agriculture. The people of the state of Nevada represented in the Senate and Assembly do act as follows, section one to section one. Thank you, are there any amendments to the bill? There are none. Thank you, Senate Bill 65, order the general file. Senate Bill number 117, introduced by Senator Seaver Cascanser, et cetera, and Assemblywoman Tolls, et cetera, revises provisions relating to economic development. The people of the state of Nevada represented in the Senate Assembly do act as follows, section one of section one. Thank you, are there any amendments to the bill? There are none. Thank you, Senate Bill 117, order the general file. Senate Bill 196, introduced by Senators Lang, et cetera, prohibits the performance of a pelvic examination in certain circumstances. The people of the state of Nevada represented in the Senate Assembly do act as follows, section one to section one. Thank you, are there any amendments to the bill? There are none. Thank you, Senate Bill 196, order to the general file. And that concludes order business number 12. Thank you, Senator Brooks. Uh, order business nine, please. Thank you. Let's go back to order of business nine, Senator Brooks. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. I move that we refer Senate Bill 117 to the Senate Finance Committee. Thank you. You have heard the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Senator Brooks. And that concludes order of business number nine. Thank you. Let's go to order of business 13, general file, third reading. We'll take a brief recess for a second. Uh, Senators, there has been an error on today's daily file and agenda. Senate Bill 47 that is sitting on the second reading that we just read is, should be on the general file for today. And so we're going to list it right under Senate Bill 58 under the general file today and read it again for final passage. All right, we're back from recess. We are on order of business 13, general file, third reading. Madam President. Uh, yes, Senator Kikafer. Can I have order of business number nine, please? Yes, let's go back to order of business number nine, Senator Kikafer. Thank you, Madam President. I would move that Senate Bill 47 be put on the Secretary's desk for purposes of an amendment. Thank you, you have heard the motion. All those in favor signify by saying yay. yay. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Thank you, Senator Kikafer. Uh, let's go back to uh, order of business 13, general file, third reading. Senate Bill number nine, introduced by Senate Committee on Judiciary, creates an exemption from licensing requirements for investment advisors to certain private funds. People state in Nevada represented in the Senate and Assembly do act as follows, section one to section one. 
Thank you. Are there any amendments to the bill as a whole? There are none. Section 12 of this act becomes effective on July 1, 2022, and if bill and this bill requires a two-thirds majority vote. Thank you. Remarks from the floor. Senator Dennis. Thank you, Madam President. Senate Bill 9 creates an exemption to the state licensure requirement for investment advisors to spe specific types of qualifying private funds as defined in federal law. In order to qualify for the licensure exemption, the investment advisor must, one, provide advice solely to one or more qualifying funds, two, not be required to register with the Securities and Exchange Commission, three, not have a, engaged in any activity that would disqualify an issuer pursuant to federal law, and four, pay any fee required by the Securities Administrator. The bill also sets forth the investment advisor's duties and disclosure and reporting requirements and defines the terms eligible fund and qualified client per federal law. An investment advisor who becomes ineligible for the exemption under this measure must comply with any applicable laws for licensure within 90 days of ineligibility. The bill becomes effective on July 1st, 2022. Thank you, Senator Dennis. Further remarks? All right, hearing none, the secretary will open the roll. Looks like everyone's voted. Does anyone wish to change his or her vote? All right. The secretary will close the roll. The vote on Senate Bill 9 is 21 in favor, zero against. The bill having received a two-thirds majority is declared passed. Order to the Assembly. Senate Bill Number 35, introduced by Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor, revises provisions relating to the Private Investigators Licensing Board. The people of the state of Nevada represented in Senate Assembly do enact as follows, Section 1 to Section 1. Thank you. Are there any amendments to the bill as a whole? There are none. Section 3, Subsection 2, end of bill. Thank you. Remarks from the floor. Senator Gokachia. Thank you, Madam President. Senate Bill 35 eliminates the fund for private investi investigators licensing board within the state general fund and instead requires the board to deposit all monies that the board receives in banks, credit unions, savings and loan associations, savings or savings banks in the state. With the exception of the fines resulting from when a hearing officer or a panel is not utilized by the board for a disciplinary matter and the fine is imposed upon a licensee. Section 2 and 3 of Senate Bill 35 are effective on passage and approval for the purposes of the board establishing a bank, credit union, or savings and loan account or other, and, and other administrative tasks, while Section 1 of Senate Bill 35 is effective on October 1st, 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gokachia. Further remarks? All right, hearing none, the Secretary will open the roll. All right, looks like everyone's voted. Does anyone wish to change his or her vote? All right, the secretary will close the roll. The vote on Senate Bill 35 is 21 in favor, zero against. The bill having received a constitutional majority is declared passed. Order of the Assembly. Senate Bill number 58 introduced by Senate Committee on Growth and Infrastructure. And revises certain functions and responsibilities of investigation division of the Department of Public Safety. The people of the state of Nevada represented in the Senate Assembly do act as follows, section one to section one. Thank you. Are there any amendments to the bill as a whole? There are none. Section 3 of this act becomes effective upon passage and approval. End of bill. Thank you. Remarks from the floor. Senator Severs Gansert. Thank you, Madam President. Senate Bill 58 revises the responsibilities of the Investigation Division of the Department of Public Safety to include investigations relating to the technological crimes and assisting other divisions within the Department of Public Safety. In addition, the bill authorizes the Investigation Division to conduct criminal investigations relating to enforcement of statutes relating to cannabis upon request by other state agencies. Finally, the measure authorizes the Investigation Division to assist any board, agency, commission, or other unit of the executive branch that requests assistance and is authorized to conduct criminal investigations. The bill becomes effective upon passage and approval. Thank you, Senator Severs Ganser. Further remarks? All right, hearing none, the secretary will open the roll. All right, looks like everyone's voted. Does anyone wish to change his or her vote? All right, secretary will close the roll. The vote on Senate Bill 58 is 21 in favor, zero against. The bill having received a constitutional majority is declared passed, order of the assembly. And that concludes order of business number 13. Thank you. Order of Business 9. 
Senate Joint Resolution Number 8 of the 80th Session, introduced by Senators Cannizzaro, etc., emergency request of the Senate Majority Leader, proposed to amend the Nevada Constitution to guarantee equal rights. End of resolution. Thank you, Senator, Ca Thank you, Senator Cannizzaro. Thank you, Madam President. Senate Joint Resolution 8 of the 80th Legislative Session proposes to amend the Nevada Constitution by adding a guarantee that equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by this state or any of its political subdivisions on account of race, color, creed, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, age, disability, ancestry, or national origin. If approved in identical form during this 2021 legislative session, the proposal will be submitted to the voters for final approval or disapproval at the 2022 general election. Uh, and Madam President, I did have some additional remarks that I wanted to share in support of Senate Joint Resolution Number 8. Um, and I begin with just a little bit of a history story. Um, in 1936, Sylvia was born in rural upstate New York, the daughter of potato farmers. As a young girl, Sylvia excelled at math in school and dreamed of graduating high school and attending college. She was smart and hardworking, earning a scholarship to go to college. But rather than graduating high school and attending college, she was told that college is not for girls. That is not what girls do. Girls, her parents explained, should not endeavor to seek an education. Sylvia never did go to college. She married and soon was the mother of four children. When her husband left home one day, she suddenly found herself alone, struggling to raise her children. Neighbors would stare. I mean, what kind of person was a single mother? She struggled to find a job and instead ended up working multiple jobs in long hours just to provide for her kids. When she attempted to get a home loan in order to try and put a roof over her children's heads, the bank refused to see her. A single woman simply could not get a loan without a husband. Sylvia's daughter, Norma, found herself looking for employment rather than finishing high school so she could help her family. She moved to Las Vegas and eventually had children of her own, three daughters. She continued to work in restaurants and eventually found herself managing one of them. One day she noticed an unexpected raise in pay and discovered another female coworker had filed a lawsuit claiming there was disparity in pay among male and female employees and won. Unbeknownst to her, she was in fact making less than her male counterparts simply because she was a woman. When Norma joined a local community service and civic organization, she looked to join the ranks of leadership, offering ideas about how to obtain grants and ways to spruce up the meeting place. She was repeatedly told that because she was a woman, she was better suited for the spouses group and not in the leadership of the organization. Early on, Norma's oldest daughter decided that she wanted to go to law school. There were many times where she was told by others that she should rethink her career decision because women don't usually make good lawyers. And besides, how would she ever find a husband if her focus was on school and not on how well you could cook? Her daughter was told she would need to be twice as smart and three times as prepared if she wanted to compete with the men in her class for jobs, internships, and the like. Imagine her surprise when during a job interview for a legal position, she was asked if she knew how to make coffee and whether she would be capable of ensuring that there was always hot coffee in the office if hired. Or when she was asked if she planned on having children soon. You know, it's so funny when we hire someone who then takes maternity leave and sometimes they don't choose to stay, which can result in vacancies and we have to cover while they're out. And so I'm sure you understand the complications if that were something in your future. That it would be better to choose to not have children to keep a career. Imagine when if she did decide to have a child, how would she keep her obligations to her chosen career path? Madam President, one of the most prevalent questions I have been asked on Senate Joint Resolution Number 8 is why we should endeavor to place equality in our own state constitution. I have been asked how this is even needed since surely we have come so far in passing legislation to ensure every person is treated equally, and certainly with a majority female legislature and with the diversity of representation amongst this body, we have come far from the days of prohibiting women from getting home loans merely because they were a single woman. And certainly that is a true statement. But this did not simply happen. We did not wake up one day and suddenly equality abounds. In fact, I would argue that despite passing laws that have incrementally eroded pieces of inequality, barriers still exist, laid bare for the world to see in the midst of a global pandemic. Ask any person who may fall within the parameters 
of the language in Senate Joint Resolution 8, whether the world is truly equal, and I would bet that despite the long way we have come, they would say that inequality still exists. One thing I think is so important to keep in mind is that this sense of equality is the result of expensive, hard-fought legal battles challenging the legal constructs which have permitted inequality to persist. Yet we are often pointed to the Constitution, or even several Nevada statutes, to say equality under the law already exists. For example, even within the text of Senate Joint Resolution Number 8, there is mention of Nevada Revised Statute 217.420, which deals with grants from the account of aid for aid of, of victims of domestic violence, and requires that an applicant provide its services without any discrimination on the basis of race, religion, color, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, marital status, natural origin or ancestry. We are pointed to specific instances where equality may be displayed to argue, see, we have no need for this type of constitutional affirmation. The first black president, the first female majority legislature, Yet the concrete examples of what it means to be diverse demonstrate that equality still eludes us. With women earning just 82% of what their male counterparts earn, black women making just 63% of that, and Latina women making just 55%, inequality still exists. In our homeless populations, there are disproportionate numbers of males, black individuals, middle-aged veterans, and the disabled. And in just the last four years, we have still fought for accommodations for pregnant mothers, equal pay for equal work, paid time off, and so many more policies to address inequality. And it also begs the question, if those statutes ensuring equality are acceptable and something that we should hang our hat on, why is that not good enough for our Constitution? There is a difference between pointing to specific instances or even a state statute and ensuring equality of treatment under the law from a constitutional perspective. Madam President, where a law is challenged because it is discriminatory in nature or its effect, the court must consider what, whether that law meets a particular standard. For example, where a law is challenged based upon whether someone is being discriminated against on account of their sex, the court, even other the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, looks to see whether the policy or law serves just an important government interest and whether it is substantially related to those objectives. Indeed, in the language of the preamble to SGR 8, it specifically mentions the general nature of the protections afforded by the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. In this acknowledgement, there is a lack of specificity in ensuring that equal rights diminishes the ability to challenge laws where the effect is discriminatory. Where, however, Madam President, there is a constitutional guarantee, a constitutional guarantee to equality, that specific guarantee ensures not only that a law is not facially discriminatory, but also ensures that in its application, it likewise is not discriminatory. It solidifies that we believe discrimination should be evaluated by ensuring the court requires the state to provide a compelling interest for the challenged law and demonstrate that the law is narrowly tailored to achieve that purpose. What we prohibit by ensuring equality in the very fabric of our Constitution is that discrimination cannot be cloaked in neutral statutory language, but it must be equal in its application. It means we cannot justify discriminatory acts because of a long-standing tradition either, that there must be a compelling interest that is best served by a narrowly tailored statute meant to address that interest. Disregarding the legal significance of why that is important is to turn a blind eye as to why we are all here to, to serve, why we pass laws in the first place. Some of the specters that have been offered to defeat SJR 8 include the naive argument that equality already exists, and thus a reaffirmation of such, inequality, uh, such equality is unnecessary. This argument, quite plainly, ignores judicial review and implicitly validates the notion that certain people ought to be protected under the law and certain others shouldn't. There are claims that this will diminish the ability for girls to play in sports activities, that we have a diminished faith somehow in female athletes or are ripping opportunities from them. But what is important to note is that SGR 8 does not seek to erase the differences between each and every person and what those differences uniquely and beautifully represent, but what it does do is ensure a quality of opportunity and the promise that simply because of your sex or gender, your race, color, or creed, that basis is not enough not sufficient 
to be treated unfairly under the law. I share with you these stories of Sylvia and Norma because these strong, inspiring women are examples of why equality is so important. Interestingly enough, in an age of proclaimed equality, I share these stories not for the first time, but for a consecutive time, nearly four years after I first shared them with this body, because the fight for equality is still ongoing. In 2016, Sylvia's granddaughter, Norma's daughter, was elected to represent the people of Senate District 6 in the Nevada State Senate. Unlike my amazing grandmother, I was able to attend college. I was able to pursue a career and was not inhibited by whether or not I knew how to make coffee or whether or not I made certain choices about whether to have a family and when to have a family without it endangering my career. But that fight is long from over. I am proud to be their granddaughter and daughter, and I stand in full support of Senate Joint Resolution Number 8. Thank you, Senator Gans Canizaro. Are there any further remarks? Senator Hansen. Thank you, Madam President. In the 2019 session right here in this chamber, we passed a bill dealing with equality, voter equality. In fact, we decided that we were going to give up select rights that Nevadans had when it came to the national popular vote. And I'm very thankful to state that even though it was a 12-8 vote in this chamber, the governor of the state of Nevada vetoed that measure because that measure actually removed selective rights that protected the citizens of the state of Nevada. I occasionally have people still come up to me and ask me, don't you believe that all votes should be counted exactly equally? And the answer when I tell them no, they're shocked. And then I give them a very simple example. Right on the other side of this mountain range, immediately to our west, are 35 million people. And those 35 million people get two United States senators. And here in Nevada, even though there are only three million people, we actually have two United States senators. We have almost a 10 to 1 voter advantage and protection under the law. That is why when we give our Pledge of Allegiance, we pledge allegiance to a republic and not a democracy. The laws actually protect and give advantages to minorities. Now, when I sat here and listened to uh, some of the uh, supposed advantages of equality, I think immediately people understand that when we give up and become completely equal when it comes to voting rights, we actually give up advantages, protections, and entitlements that exist under our Constitution. And I just started thinking of a handful of the advantages and benefits that we have in our laws now that protect women. We have athletic scholarships for women only, women only sports. We have special laws on alimony, family law, child custody, battered women only shelters, women only academic scholarships, specific offices reserved exclusively for women, additional penalties for harming pregnant women, uh, preferential treatment in custody hearings, blue collar labor standards with protections for women, physical testing examinations that are different for women, military draft, uh, bathroom and locker room facilities. These all are laws that exist now and in fact give protections to women. And if we were truly going to have equality, in, just like with equality in voting, you would actually give up those rights. Why in the world would we want to do that? Now, I have, uh, of course, a wife, a mother. I have four sisters. I have four daughters. I have eight granddaughters. I have 23 nieces, most of all of which, by the way, live in the state of Nevada. And I don't want to see them give up the rights and privileges and advantages that the feminist movement, frankly, has put on the books to protect them and give them advantages. Because especially when it comes to physical things, males have a distinctive advantage. Now the question comes up, um, equal pay, disparity in pay. That one right now, if there is, that is already against the law. We have an attorney general of the state of Nevada that would love an opportunity to aggressively prosecute anyone in the state that knowingly violates that and pays a man more than a woman or a woman more than a man for that matter. Once we put this, in, this into the Constitution, we also remove our ability as a legislative body to actually 
amend in, 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 uh, inequalities that will exist in the law. Once it's in the Constitution, it's a whole lot more difficult for a legislative body to go in and make necessary changes. So I don't see any possible logical reason to essentially undo what several generations of the feminist movement have successfully placed in law. And I didn't even touch on Title IX, uh, th those sorts of situations. We actually have, by the way, our own version of Title IX in NAC 385, if you'd like to look it up. And when I look uh, at situations like we just had a beauty pageant where a, all the women contestants were actually defeated by a biological male right here in Nevada, and that's a stepping stone to becoming Miss Nevada, are we going to really deny the women those opportunities to get those scholarships and to have that unique uh, uh, title of Miss Nevada by allowing somebody who is actually biologically a male? I mean, we have some incredibly confused thinking in our, our nation at the moment. We have parents who are going to wait till their children grow up to determine whether or not they're a boy or a girl, and they get to make the determination. You might as well wait for them to also say which planet is the sun and which planet is the moon because there are biological factors called the X and Y chromosomes that determine that prior to birth. So I think we need to also spend a little bit of time, you know, there are people in this room that have said, don't you believe in science, Ira, when it comes to the climate debate? I do believe in science. I also believe in science when it comes to biology. And I don't know of anything that's more basic in science than that. Now, I would also say that there's a certain sense of deja vu. Um, you know, when Alice Paul wrote the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923, she just included the word sex. We have added nine additional categories to that original Equal Rights Amendment. And in my opinion, most of those early feminists, if they were to review this and see that basically all the advantages that have been placed in law are going to be stripped away just as we would strip away our voter rights if we actually came to a true equality in everything, they would think we've all lost our minds. Especially in a female majority legislature, there's literally nothing that this body cannot do now and has done, frankly. And uh, last but not least, in November of 1978, the Equal Rights Amendment was on the ballot in Nevada. And it was defeated by more than two to one and the most aggressive opponents were grassroots women of Nevada who did not want to give up the advantages they had. So, and I think, frankly, this thing, when it goes on the ballot, is facing a, a similar defeat, simply because of one inclusion, gender identity and expression, which, if placed in law, will allow biological males to compete in all of the areas currently reserved exclusively for women. So I don't want to see this body give up the rights for all of my female children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, or any other women in, in the state of Nevada. I would urge this body to vote no on SJR 8 and give some serious consideration to the ramifications for all the girls that are going to lose the advantages, entitlements, and privileges that the, the uh, feminist movement have so aggressively placed in law for their very protection. Thank you, Madam uh, President, and I urge my colleagues to vote no for the good of the women of the state of Nevada on SJR 8. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hansen. Senator Spearman. Thank you, Madam President. And so, I was born a little girl, a little black girl who grew up to be a black woman. And so I am one of the people that is affected by the lack of equality in our Constitution, and for that matter, the U.S. Constitution. So, so let me just break it down to you as a girl and as a woman. Over the years, the quest for equality has been met with the same obstinance over and over and over again. In fact, many of the arguments that are against it today were the same ones that were against it in the 70s. Again, I'm speaking as a girl that grew up to be a woman, a black woman. That's important because 
Most of the time I see the people who are arguing against this equality were born in privilege. If we want to go back to history, the Constitution was not even written for, for average white men. It was written for white, wealthy men. And over the years, it has morphed to include supposedly everybody. I don't believe that. And I don't believe that because most of the people in the generation before me couldn't even vote until the Voting Rights Act passed. Most of the people in the generation before me had to watch the signs colored or white on the water fountains. You want to talk about men going to the restroom? How about putting a sign up that says colored and white in the restroom? That's what I grew up with. But you know what? We have not given up yet, and we will not give up now. Those born in privilege have no idea, no idea what it feels like to be excluded based on, if you want to call it sex, you want to call it gender, I don't care what you call it. Because at the end of the day, my gender is also accompanied by my blackness that has experienced and still experiences racism and sexism and, oh, by the way, as a member of the LGBTQ community, homophobia. So how about that? H how about that? We don't give up. We're going, to, we're going to persist. Abolitionists persisted to end the heinous practice of slavery. Negroes, as we were called then, in the South persisted to end Jim Crow. African Americans also persisted to get the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Cesar Chavez and migrant workers persisted to improve working conditions. Vietnam veterans persisted to get the health care that they so deserved and the recognition of their service and appreciation for their sacrifice. HIV AIDS activists persisted to ensure that they had the human dignity that God had already given to them. When we stop and think about this, I ain't asking nobody to give me the right to be equal. Let me be clear about that. Because you know what? I was born equal. The ERA does not, does not say this is the only way you can be equal. What we're saying in the ERA is recognize my equality. Again, I say those who were born in privilege and never had to walk into a store and be followed around and asked, what are you doing? Those who, who have walk in, walked into grocery stores and had to be careful about what you said, what you did. Those who lived in the South and you were concerned about being lynched, women, women who even when they are raped by someone who is not drunk and because they are an athlete, oh, boys will be boys. BS, bird seed. I ain't asking you to give me equal rights. What I'm saying in this is you need to recognize my equal rights, just like you recognize my blackness, just like you recognize my womanness. Recognize that. Recognize that. If you look through the lens of the lived experience of most women, and I would venture to say probably all women in the BIPOC community, because to a certain extent, white women have been placed on a pedestal which was one of the reasons they had mammies. Mammies, you probably read about that in history, mammies, so that they could take care of the kids and let the newborn babies suck on their breasts. It really had no, no milk in it, but that's what they did. That's what they did. When you stop and you take a look at my lived experience through the lens of my life, you know exactly why I support the ERA. If you can comprehend what it means to have to fight every day of your life 
to be recognized as equal if you understand that you know why we should vote yes. I understand it. Because ain't no equality come to me easy. And I know ain't is probably not a proper word, but I got three degrees, so I'm going to use it again. We ain't going to stop fighting. Not now. Not ever. Yes, in 1978, Nevadans overwhelmingly defeated an ERA amendment, which was, oh, by the way, after the first black man to be a senator in Nevada, Senator Neal had fought so hard to bring it through to that point. And he believed in it then. He believed in it then, and he lived that belief. We want to say that everybody's equal? No, everybody is not equal. If you look at the riot that happened at the Capitol on January the 6th, and then you look at what happened to the marchers who had the legal right to protest, even here in Nevada, shot with rubber bullets. They didn't have any guns. They didn't have poles to, ble to beat police with. They weren't shouting obscenities. They were just asking for justice. If you understand why I'm so passionate about fighting for equality, you know exactly what I have lived through all of my life. Discrimination after discrimination. Clothed in, we're just trying to help you. No, I don't need your help. What I need you to do is recognize by equality. That's what SJR is about. And I'm sure there are many in, this, many in this room that will vote, quote, their conscience. And I want them to do that because I'm going to vote my conscience. And I'm going to vote the conscience of my mother. And I'm going to vote the conscience of my grandmother. I'm going to vote the conscience of my sisters. I'm going to vote the conscience of my great-grandmother. I'm going to vote the conscience of every woman that I have ever met who has struggled for equality. Yeah, I'm going to vote my conscience. And that's why I would urge this body to vote yes on SJR 8. And this is a black girl who grew up to be a black woman that wants recognition in the Nevada Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Spearman. Senator Severs Cancer. Thank you, Madam President. I support SGR 8 today as I did two years ago. This is actually the third time I've supported a measure on equality of rights over the last three legislative sessions. The first time I was a lone Republican, and last time I was joined by several, several of my Republican colleagues. I do not view equality as a partisan issue. Members of this body are elected to review material, get the facts, and make decisions. Particularly on this piece of legislation, the rhetoric, the rhetoric is rampant, and the what-if scenarios are ample. I have close friends and family on both sides of this issue. This resolution raises our emotions because it feels very, very personal. The resolution includes powerful words that can make a difference in people's lives. Let's pause for a moment and think about who we know and who we are, that we are people of different colors, religions, sexual orientations, and more. This body itself reflects great diversity. The words of the resolution reflect people of great diversity, and we are talking about whether they, as individuals, should have equality of rights under the law. I've taken time to review and research what the resolution means in form and practice. SGR 8 simply states, Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by this state or any of its political subdivisions on account of race, color, creed, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, age, disability, ancestry, or national origin. It gets, again, it states, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged. That is a clear statement of purpose. This amendment to the Constitution is limited to this state or any of it, its political subdivisions not the private sector. This amendment is limited in scope. We have passed dozens of statutes to make sure people cannot be fired, denied housing, or denied public services because of race, color, creed, sex, 
sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, age, disability, ancestry, or national origin. Our state level equal rights amendment will strengthen these protections. Specifically, we've had questions concerning religious protections. I firmly believe we must have freedom of religion. I'm a lifelong practicing Catholic and my religion is important to me. During the Senate's Legislative Operations and Elections Committee, I specifically asked about protection of religious beliefs. The record clearly established that the word creed, the word creed covers religious beliefs. But in addition, the Nevada Constitution in Article I already protects freedom of religion, so there is already a constitutional provision that prohibits laws that provide unequal treatment based on religious beliefs, as those laws would be impinging on freedom of religion. The reference to creed provides the same type of protection that would already be included in Article I. It is also protected by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. This amendment secures religious freedom. We've also had questions on athletics. When asked about gender-specific sports teams for schools, the Legislative Council Bureau Legal Division responded to my questions to state that because, of the, state, because the state has a compelling governmental interest in ensuring competitive balance and the integrity of school sports, the amendment would not prohibit, prohibit having gender-specific sports teams for schools. Again, the amendment would not prohibit having gender-specific sports teams for schools. Regarding abortion, in 1972, Texas amended its state constitution to include equality under the law shall not be denied or abridged because of sex, race, color, creed, or national origin. Despite the language, the state still has many restrictions on abortion. In contrast, New York has not amended its constitution to include a pro prohibition on sex discrimination, but is considered one of the most aggressive abortion rights states in the country. Clearly, the intent of this resolution is not to restrict religious freedom, undermine women's athletics, or expand abortion practices in Nevada. Rather, the intent is as stated, to provide equality of rights under the law. Our system of checks and balances will see challenges and address all these issues over time. We were elected to make hard decisions. I've weighed the facts and consciously set aside the hyperbole. I'm left with the conclusion that equality is essential to our society. I choose to be on the side of history where all people have the right to equality under the law, so my vote will be a strong and resounding yes. I support this amendment and support providing Nevadans the opportunity to vote on this measure. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Severs Gansard. Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam President. I rise in support of SJR 8. Audrey Lord once said, when I dare to be powerful and use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. These words have fueled my life as a woman and my life as a black woman. It fueled my mother's life as a mulatto woman. The ERA is and was a powerful movement, yet black women still struggle for equality. We continue to ask for the equal right to be paid the same as, other, as our other racial counterparts. We still seek not to be cast into the deep myth of stereotypes that have blemished our lives. This nation has chosen who they would like to give rights to. It has been super selective about the power it wishes to bestow upon groups. In 1920, women got the right to vote, but this didn't apply to black women who were still disenfranchised by poll taxes, tests on the Constitution, and violence. In 1924, Native American women under the Citizenship Act were given the right to vote. In 1952, Asian American women who happened to be a naturalized immigrant were then given the right to vote under the Walter McCarran Act. In 1975, the United States then allowed people with limited English to then get the right to vote. This was an amendment to the 1964 Voting Rights Act. I cite these milestones because of the selective attitudes in which classes of people were entitled to rights and which ones were not. Having a father who fought for the ERA in 1977 and a mother who in the early 80s decided she would quit working and build her own business, she dared to be powerful in the service of her vision. As many other women I know who dared to simply be by refusing to be sidelined and marginalized, 
One of my largest goals has been to speak power into women, even if she was on welfare, even if she was a young student hopeful to graduate from college, that who you imagine, who you dream to be, who you dare to be in the service of your vision is the greatest power. So do not be afraid, do not be silenced, but be fearless in the service of your identity. So I close with Audre Lorde who said, silence has never protected you and it never will. So I support SJR 8. Thank you, Senator Neal. Senator Scheibel. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to remind this body that it is the tool of the oppressor to turn the oppressed against each other. As if trans women aren't also women, as if trans girls aren't also girls, as if the barriers I experienced or my colleagues from Senate Districts 1, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 11, 13, 15, and 21 were erected by transgender people. It's not just sexism, but misogyny that has stifled our voices and that has attempted to crush our spirits, not just today, not just yesterday, but for generations. Creating an artificial fear, a boogeyman, somebody else that will threaten our equality, that will threaten our dignity, is the tool of the oppressor to ensure that those of us who have not been treated equally under the law will look at each other instead of at the system that has created that inequality. To provoke infighting, to, to devise division, to sow that argument and that antipathy is a false narrative that pits us against each other. Suggesting that transgender men are not men or transgender women are not also women is wrong. And here in the state of Nevada, we believe in equality. And we come to this legislature every day to ensure that all of our constituents are heard in the Senate, in the Assembly, and in our government. We don't ask them to point fingers at each other. We look at ourselves and we ask what more can we do for Nevadans to ensure that every child grows up realizing their full potential to be an athlete, an artist, a lawyer, an author, or to win a beauty pageant. A woman won the Miss Silver State Beauty Pageant this year, and her name is Cataluna Enriquez. And I want to tell you something that she shared with the press. I wish I had a chance to talk to her before sharing this, but since she told the Prom Valley Times, I hope she won't mind that I'm repeating it. She said, I wanted to share my story and present that I was more than just a body. With pageantry, people think it is only about beauty, but it's how you present yourself, what you advocate for, what you've done, and the goals you have. As Nevadans, this part's not her, this part is me. As Nevadans, our goal should always be to improve upon the, to improve upon the laws that we've already passed, to strengthen our resolve, to be equal, to treat others with equality and dignity, and not just that, but kindness and compassion, to recognize that every single Nevadan has the right to be treated equally under the law. And that right is not just something that we talk about on the Senate floor. It's not just something that we'll tweet about later today, but it is a legal protection that allows the people who are actually suffering, who are actually oppressed, some chance at justice. It offers them hope that one day a court of law will look at their case and see, recognize that they have been oppressed and make some kind of change. They will get their day in court. They will get that ruling that says every single Nevadan shall be treated the same 
under the law. It might not be enough. Here in this body, we cannot change every heart and mind with a speech or with a vote or with a bill. But what we can do is stand up for what's right, do right by our constituents, and vote to pass SJR 8. Thank you, Senator Scheibel. Senator Orenshaw. Thank you very much, President. And uh, I, I rise in support of Senate Joint Resolution 8. And I've been looking back at the history of the uh, Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s. In 1973, in this chamber, uh, there were only four senators who were willing to vote yes in support of the original Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, my colleague, my colleague's father, State Senator Joe Neal, uh, State Senator Richard Bryan, uh, Spike Wilson from Reno, and our GOP friend Cliff Young from Reno. Uh, the rest of the chamber was no. 1978, as my colleague from Sparks said, uh, the measure failed on the ballot. That is a different state than it was back then. And Nevada's changed. Our constituents have changed. Voting for this will give our, our constituents a chance to, to weigh in on this. And when it passes, it will mean so much to so many people who, who never had these kinds of rights before. I do, do urge its support. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Orange. All Senator Harris. Thank you, Madam President. I speak in support of SJR 8 today. And I just wanted to get a, a couple of things on the record. I promise I won't keep you all too long. No woman, no minority has an advantage in America, not by law, not by any other mechanism. We have placed tax breaks and explicit inequality into the Nevada Constitution. But it's equality that makes some of us nervous. Only those who don't need laws to protect their rights have the audacity to proclaim that there are advantages that will go away by enshrining equality into law. And regarding transgender women participating in, in female sports, I'm a female athlete, I'm not scared. I welcome my transgender female colleagues the idea that any biological male would pretend to be transgender just to take away a scholarship from a biological female is absurd. It demonstrates how far we still have to go to understand the shoes that our transgender citizens walk in. No one chooses to be transgender. There are no benefits. Transgender people face frequent experiences of discrimination, violence, social and economic marginalization, and abuse across their lifetime. From the best data that we can collect, a transgender person is murdered at least once every three days. If anything belongs in the Constitution, it's equality. I think we have to take some time to think about why it is the systems that are set up how they are, why we even have to say it. But we do. I urge its passage. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Harris. Senator Hammond. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, uh, today, I have had, I've had over the last month or so several conversations, emails, voicemails, uh, you name it, on this issue. And uh, I know two years ago how I voted, and so I wanted to make sure that uh, I, I'm going to go over my statement from two years ago and in inject a few thoughts for today. Um, two years ago, I said that uh, in the limited time that I had to review the bill, well, I can't really say that today. We've had two years to look at uh, the contents of the bill, the, the, the message that it uh, uh, that it uh, conveys, and uh, I've had a lot of time to talk to people about where we, you know, what it says and what it doesn't say. Uh, many of the uh, arguments against have been, uh, I would have to say, conjecture, you know, what might happen, the ramification if this happens. Uh, but I try to look at 
the face of the bill, what it's asking us to do as legislators and eventually the, to the people of the, of the state of Nevada, what we're asking them to vote on. I can find no part of it that is anything other than equality under the law. I said it two years ago and I still say it today. The issue before us today is not one of social issues. It will be perhaps one day, maybe that we will see policies and laws um, passed, uh, and I'm sure debate will continue. Uh, I'm sure there will be court cases adjudicated, and I'm sure that uh, we will come to conclusions on certain issues as uh, has, has been described by some of my colleagues on the floor today. But as far as this bill, I'm comfortable with the fact that it's going to make its way to the people, and it is the people who make the final decision on it. I'm comfortable with that. We will have debates on other issues, and I've said that before, I won't repeat that here, but this is a question of justice, period. We can have no true justice or no true just society without first and foremost ensuring each citizen is equal under the eyes of the law. I said that two years ago and I believe it still today. Additionally, I said this, while debating the 14th Amendment, the great abolitionist and lawmaker Thaddeus Stevens said, and I quote, I don't hold with equality in all things, only with equality before the law and nothing more, unquote. I believe that. You know, we cannot state that everything is equal. We know that's not true. If that were true, then I would be in the NBA and I'd be making a lot of money right now. My body is not equal to that of a six foot 10, very athletic, very young person. It just doesn't happen that way. We know that geography sometimes will dictate you know, the equality, the, the, the ability to earn a uh, living in some places. Uh, you know, there are certain rivers in uh, the world where you don't have the ability to navigate, and therefore the economy is not the same as another place like the Mississippi, where the economy uh, was afforded to those who lived on that river. Just there's lots of things that are not equal in this world. Those are just some examples. But under the law, we can all be equal. So therefore... I cannot in good conscience vote against something that calls for nothing more than equality under the law for all people. Although I look forward to the discussions that will happen in the future, I will say this, Nevada has always led the way when it comes to freedom and equality under the law. It's at the very root of the foundation that made our state in 1864. And it holds true today by enshrining the rights of women to be treated and all other groups in this uh, amendment uh, to be treated equally. We do nothing more than recognize that their parity in the human race and ensure that Nevada remains a national model for freedom loving people everywhere. It's 2021 folks. And the time for arguments like what a woman's place is have passed. I have three daughters and a wife. I don't speak for my wife, I never have. I'll get in trouble when I do. But I will say this for my, my daughters, regardless of politics and how I feel about policy at the national level or even the state level, the fact is my three daughters can look to the White House and to the administration there and see somebody who looks like them. And that's amazing. So for today, I have to say that I am a yes on SJR 8. Thank you, Senator Hammond. Senator Pickard. Thank you, Madam President. I uh, have thought uh, quite a bit about this, uh, as has been mentioned by many of my colleagues, uh, but particularly my vote last session on uh, SJR 8. Uh, I've thought a lot about it, not because I thought I was wrong, uh, but because of the response that my vote engendered within my district. Uh, I was actually a little surprised uh, to get the volume of response that I did. Uh, and in the run-up to today's vote, it was no different. I am uh, encouraged and a little surprised to, to hear uh, some of the statements made today, uh, asking for kindness where kindness has not been found in this building many times. However, I moved uh, again this session by the remarks of my colleague from Senate District 1. recognition of our rights and our responsibilities in this building should be tantamount to our duties here. I personally have consistently encouraged votes on the merits of the bill that is before us, or in this case, the resolution. 
And I find no problem with the language of this bill or of this resolution. It calls for equality under the law, and that's something I have stood for since long before I entered the legislature. I do understand the concerns of my constituents that the language will be misinterpreted and misused to promote changes in social order that is incompatible with their personal beliefs. And I think that is just as valid as the comments made here today. But while I may share those concerns, I still believe that we should be supporting equality under the law. And here I was going to also quote uh, Adlai Stevenson, but I will refrain and just say that the idea that this bill should go to the vote of the people is what gives me peace in thinking that, yes, we are a different society today than we were 20, 30, 40 years ago. In fact, I think of uh, my grandmother, who in 1920 had a PhD in chemistry, chose to teach at the high school level and became a principal, although that was certainly a rarity at the time. She was also a single mother for most of, or for the latter part of my father's uh, um, uh, youth. She had many of the disadvantages that were uh, found in being a single mother. But at the end of the day, she persevered, and she was a remarkable example to my father and, and my uncle. Today, I think, is a day that we can celebrate, not because we think similarly or because we believe that this resolution should or should not pass, but because we have an opportunity to vote on it as representatives of our constituents. Whether or not we vote in, you know, consistent with our constituents will be up to our, our constituents to decide, but that we have the right and the ability to vote today should be celebrated, and I will be a yes on SJR 8. Thank you, Senator Pickard. Further remarks? All right, hearing none, the secretary will open the roll. Madam President. I'm sorry, um, who is talking? Oh, Senator, oh, Senator Hardy, I'm sorry, Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam President. I, I look at the word rights uh, and consider the right to choose, which I call agency. Agency is such a critical, eternal, universal principle that both good and bad things happen in the world. And we each have our agency. We make laws that some of our choices uh, will have negative consequences, yet the person with agency can still ignore or disobey the law with potential ensuing tragedies such as happened yesterday in Colorado. Every decision we make has consequences positively or negatively eventually. My goal is to follow my ultimate leader and invite others to do the same in a non-judgmental way that will not interfere with their opportunity to reach their greatest potential for personal peace and joy. I hope that in our efforts to facilitate, facilitate some to legitimately exercise their agency that we do not adversely affect the agency of others. I will be supporting this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hardy. Further remarks? All right. Hearing none, the secretary will open the roll. All right. Looks like everyone's voted. Does anyone wish to change his or her vote? All right. The secretary will close the roll. The vote on SJR 8 is 18 in favor, 3 against. The resolution having received a constitutional majority is declared passed. Order the assembly. And that concludes order business 9 and business of the desk for this legislative day. Thank you. Order business 16. Remarks from the floor. 
Senator Dunyate. Thank you, Madam President. Our nation stood together in silence as we watched the atrocity that occurred less than 24 hours ago inside of a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. Yesterday was another reminder to all of us here in this chamber of the senseless tragedies that have precipitated from the epidemic known as gun violence. Gun violence is a leading cause of premature deaths in the United States. According to the American Public Health Association, guns kill more than 38,000 people and cause nearly 85,000 injuries each year. Every single time an event like this occurs, we mourn together and question to ourselves, how could this happen? Where did we go wrong? Let me be clear, we let this happen and we are all guilty of failing to act every time it occurs. My generation has experienced this issue unlike any other. We have grown up practicing active shooter drills early on in elementary school, all the way into our college years, practicing to hide beneath our desks and learning the right ways to barricade a door from an intruder. We wore orange in middle school to show solidarity not realizing the trauma and consequences that would follow us after. This is an issue that is sown within our own culture, and it is something that we cannot fail to ignore anymore. The burden of gun violence in the United States and here in Nevada has shown to us just how valuable prevention and deterrence can be, but there is still so much work to be done and far fewer ways for us to be held accountable. It is not surprising to me that every time this occurs, we can already assume that it was probably some young male teen teenage male that had pushed on the boundaries of insecurity and fragility, and yet we remain in standstill, wondering how we can take action to support, forgetting that we have an underfunded mental health system right in front of us. Gun violence is not inevitable. It can be prevented, and just like we are seeing right now with the policy actions for COVID-19. We, when we politicize human suffering and public health, we fail to act on issues that have restrained us for far too long May we pray for the families that were affected, support public health research and programming to help reduce the burden of gun violence, and fight for a day when we no longer have to send our thoughts and prayers for a tragedy that could have been easily prevented. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Danyate, for the remarks. All right, Senator Canizaro. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I move that the Senate stand in adjournment until the hour of 11 a.m. on Wednesday, March 24th, 2021. Thank you. Oh, you I'm sorry, the... Madam President, oh, one, one moment. minute recess before we take no, the Let's take it. Uh, I did mean to make that motion, Madam President, on adjournment. Where the motion stands? Oh, all right. We have a motion to adjourn till tomorrow at 11. All those in favor signify by saying yay. yay. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. See you tomorrow at 11.